Hi, welcome to Eye Openers. I'm your host, Brittany Drozd, and each week I bring you insightful conversations with entrepreneurs that will help you make more money, become a strong leader, and build a business culture that you're proud of. Grab your coffee and let's dive in. Hello and welcome to Eye Openers. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, Tom, for joining me today. How are you? Very good. Very good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Well, I'm great because, of course, you guys know I love my eye-opening beverages. And for me today, it is just your basic coffee. Well, Tom, you're from Santa Barbara, so you know Handlebar Coffee Roasters, right? I have heard of them. I'm not a coffee guy, but I hear a lot about this. And My well, wife is a coffee person, so I hear it from her. Let's on here. We can chat for with sure. her about coffee. Um, I love those guys over there. It's fun to, you know, um, buy from somebody local. And so that's what I'm drinking today. But I am drinking it from my special Hawaii mug. So, ah, so it should have Kona coffee or something in there. I know. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. Um, but this is one of my favorite places in the world. Kailua, Lanikai in Oahu, and it definitely makes me nostalgic. But that's me. What are you drinking today, Tom? Well, I have a, I don't know if you can see this, but I guess it's my green latte. Your green latte. Your green latte. (laughs) Um, So it's a really interesting, I make it every day, green drink that has all kinds of lettuce, celery, spinach, garlic, kale, avocado, few other things, throw it all in the blender and, and it's like, you know, basically your, your super food, uh, for the day. So and it's, it actually tastes really good too. So I really, that's my coffee. Nice. Okay. I love it. Um, uh, Brian Cobus is joining us. He's saying he's drinking coffee with me as well. Um, but I, I love, um, that kind of vitality in the glass there that you have. Is that your own recipe that you use or you just kind of go off of what's in no, the fridge? It, it was a bit of our own recipe. So um, long story, but like when COVID hit, you know, I had prior to COVID, I'd been traveling a lot and eating out and gaining a lot of weight, doing things, you know, that eating and drinking too much that you shouldn't be drinking. <laughs> and, and, you know, my wife and I said, okay, we're going to be locked at home. How do we, you know, lose some weight and get more healthy? And so we were trying to come up with like high nutrition type of things that we could make ourselves. You know, you can buy a lot of stuff that you can do. And so we just kind of kept trying and and doing different things. And, you know, some of the ones we did in the beginning were horrible. Um, <laughs> and the one secret we actually found with this one is, I don't know if you can see it, but it's, it's a pretty good consistency, right? It's not yeah. like super loose. The key to that is the avocado. So you take a half an avocado, mm-hmm. drop it in there, and it really makes it like a really, won't go so far as a shake, but kind of a consistency that is um, a little bit thicker than just like a traditional, if you put a bunch of lettuce and celery in a blender what would, what would happen. So. Right. um, That would be a bit more watery, but then sometimes I know when I make mine, I don't use a juicer, I use a blender. And so sometimes it's too chunky, but it sounds the avocado I know from experience as well, makes it creamier and like a smoother consistency. Yep. Yep. And we got this super good blender, the Vitamix one that, you know, basically is like a jet and everything (laughs) kind of um, really, really chops up really well and, and all of that. So yeah, there's a lot of really good nutrition in there and that way, if I miss my, you know, vegetables at a meal, I don't feel bad. Do you find that like it shifts your, like your ability to focus? Like I know for me when, so I like to put ginger in mine. I'm curious to hear. Uh, ginger's you. in this actually. That's, that's great. Yeah. Yep, I have some ginger that, in here. That really helps me like, okay, I'm on like, when I have something like that. Yeah. I actually drink some of this usually around this time. And then again, in the middle of the afternoon, uh-huh. I guess some people drink sodas or Dr. Peppers or coffee or whatever, but this is sort of my pick me up along the way. And it's just, it's got garlic in it and stuff like that. So it just, it has a good flavor. Yeah. And anti-inflammatory. I definitely have to try the garlic. I have to say, I've never done that before. So I'm a little bit, I'm curious now. Got lemon, lemon, garlic. Um, I'll send you the recipe. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Maybe we can post it too. In the yeah. Room. There we go. Um, okay. Well, let's give you a formal introduction here because people are like, well, who's this guy, Tom? And why should I be tuning in? And why should He's I care? He's a health food guy. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. We we are very much about the business and leadership insights here. People are here to, you know, hear about your, hear some of your wisdom, gain some of those nuggets. So, you know, Tom has over 30 years of experience helping forward thinking businesses develop and, and 
implement innovative technology-based strategies and solutions to drive sales and predictable revenue growth. So that was kind of like a big mouthful, but I'm going to let you talk more about that in a second. Give us some clarity on what exactly it is that you do. Um, but right now you're an investor and co-founder in Lead Smart Technologies, which has developed an innovative and unique CRM and collaboration platform that enables businesses to visualize what is taking place in their with their prospects and customers and proactively assist these prospects and customers to reach the revenue zone. Now, the revenue zone, that sounds familiar to me because that is the name of your new book, right? It is, yes, yes. Um, I don't know if you can see that here, but there oh, it is. Yeah. There, for those of you watching yeah. live streaming with video, you can see his book right there. So um, give us a bit of maybe some brief milestone breakdowns about your experience to date and help us, um, well, just understand that mouthful. I just read yeah, about your yeah. experience. So I have kind of a weird background. So I'm, as you mentioned, I'm in Santa Barbara. I went to school in Santa Barbara and I graduated with a degree in computer science. So I'm an engineer and a geek by, by training. Well, we and, don't call that here and we don't call yeah. that, we just call that unique. It's unique. <laughs> um, and when I, and I left school, I'm going to date myself. I left school in the late eighties. And I got a job at a startup, a software startup, which was really rare at that time. Like they didn't mm -hmm. exist and here in Santa Barbara. So right. I was, I think the fourth employee, it was a really early startup. It was founded by what professor at UCSB and, um, cool. and it was, I spent, ended up spending 10 years there. And when we sold the company, there were over 400 employees, I believe. And as I tell everybody, it was my on the ground MBA program because everything that did could happen, did happen um, over those 10 years that, you know, in business. But during that time, I shifted pretty quickly from being an engineer, which is where I started in the company, to the business side and the sales and the marketing and the operation side of the business. Mm -hmm. And kind of a funny story on that is that I was building one of our products and I was an engineer and I was complaining that our salespeople weren't selling enough of it. <laughs> you know, it's like real easy for me to say, right? Right. And, and then I, after a while, I was like, okay, I'm going to go do this myself. And, um, so I found a way to kind of get myself out of engineering and into the sales and marketing side. And then I learned pretty quickly that it wasn't quite as easy as I thought it was going to be. Um, you know, not so smug anymore. Huh? Yeah, the grass wasn't quite as green on those, uh, on that other side of the fence over there. But since then I've been in running businesses and more on the sales marketing and, and in operation side of a business my the rest of my career even though i stay kind of fluent with technology i'm not an engineer per se from a from a profession perspective so um exited that software company did consulting for a number of years created another software company that i sold to into it a few years ago i ended up getting into digital marketing because i really loved the whole concept of being able to measure and engineer marketing a bit um mm -hmm. which was always a problem in my I just never liked the idea of, you know, hey, let's go spend $30,000 on an ad in a magazine and cross our fingers and hope that something comes out of it, which is what we did back in back in the day. So, um, yeah, and so then in the last, you know- You wanted kind of, to be able to pull out some more objective results and either yeah. like reinforce that this was a good decision, this was a good investment or it wasn't, and be able to have companies make smarter marketing decisions for themselves. Yeah, I mean, you're right, as an engineer in particular, right, you want to be able to measure your results. So if you do something, what impact or what result are you getting from that impact and not having it be, you know, kind of nebulous? You know, the what is the saying is that, you know, you don't know where 50, you you 50% 50 of your marketing dollars are wasted. You just don't know which 50%, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's like that never, that never did well with me. So, you know, when, and when I, when, our, when the company I had got acquired by Intuit, I went and worked for Intuit for a period of time and they were just getting started with their whole digital marketing strategy. And so I got a lot of really interesting exposure that I wouldn't have normally got. I just got enamored with it really is what it boiled down to. I had an agency for, I was part of an agency for a few years and mm -hmm. I kind of got the software bug again um, with Lead Smart. And the, and the book really came about from just kind of a, not, a culmination of a lot of that, but more importantly, recently in the last couple of years, really seen a shift in just the whole process of how buyers want to buy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fact that we have the ability as buyers to, 
you know, have so much information and we don't generally want to deal with a salesperson if we don't have to. You have a lot of shift towards more millennials and younger buyers that don't have the tolerance for maybe sales that some of the us older people have had and things like that. So a lot of the book came together from my experience and kind of what I learned. You know, I found that I had to change the way I was doing things. And I figured if I had to change, others had to change. And so that's where the book ultimately came from. So that's the quick snapshot. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. So right now you're working with, you're working on the CRM company and and then the book came from that. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay. And that is really looking at what is the right way to, or the more modern modern way to look at sales. So changing your mindset around yeah. what works in sales. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I call the book, the subtitle is The Ultimate Playbook for the Next Generation of B2B Sales, Marketing, and Predictable Revenue Growth. So mm-hmm. it's really, okay, how do we sell and market as we go forward to be successful versus relying on what we've done in the past? Because what we've done in the past is clearly not going to work and is not working as we go forward. Right. I was literally just on the phone with somebody for the last 90 minutes and we were talking about changes in their pipeline, even though they've been doing the same thing. And it's like, well, maybe it's not you guys, you know, maybe the trend is shifting, right? Like what is working is changing and we need to get in front of that. Yeah. And just the, and we could have a whole separate conversation Mm -hmm. on this, just this whole idea of, you know, what people think of as leads and in the B2B world, you have, you know, marketing qualified leads and sales qualified leads and All of that stuff, I think, is is the past. And you just have to really look at how you're going to really help your prospect, you know, create demand for what you sell and build trust. And how do you do that in a self-serve way where the buyer and the prospect wants to be in control of their own journey? And that, in a nutshell, is what I talk a lot about, about how to actually do in the the book. Awesome. What is one nugget about that that you could share with us because I encounter this all the time in the organizations and leaders that I work with. How do you shift and how do you change the way we we should think about um, demand or lead generation? Well, it's, it's, and again, there's a mindset shift, right? So the, I call it the old school mindset is, hey, you get a lead, right? And as quickly as possible, you get that lead on the phone with a salesperson. So that salesperson can ideally control the journey that that lead is going down, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of companies still operate that way. It's like, okay, I I mean, you probably get, I get tons of phone calls or or even emails that literally are cold emails like, hey, I saw your website. Can we jump on a phone call? Or LinkedIn Uh, messages. Yeah, or LinkedIn message, right? Or an email or whatever. Yeah. So really, that's kind of the old school mindset. So the revenue zone mindset, as I talk about, is first of all, you kind of have to understand that the you have to respect the fact that the buyer wants to be in control of their own journey. You have to respect the fact that the buyer or the prospect wants to be rename, remain anonymous. So they don't want to have to talk to a salesperson unless they really need to or, or want to rather, maybe more than anything else. And then you have to respect the fact that when they do reach out to talk to a salesperson, they expect that person to be more of a consultant or a guide or an advisor rather than a salesperson along the way. So you say, well, gosh, how do you do that? Right. How do you actually create predictable revenue? How do you grow a business when you're not in control of the sales cycle and you're not, you know, all of that. And that's what I go into in the book is you basically have the revenue zone. So I'll back up the revenue zone basically, as I define it is, it's a place where the prospect is at a point where they're seriously considering doing business with you. Mm -hmm. But for them to ascend to that level, you have to build demand and build trust. How do you do that in a self-serve world? You have to kind of define that yellow brick road that you want them to go down. And that's what I go through in the book is, how do you define that yellow brick road that that you guide that prospect down Mm -hmm. digitally? Um, Right. And then how do you track that and know that they're following the road and they haven't fallen off the road? And Right. So creating their own yellow brick road. Exactly. The results are looking for. Very cool. Yeah. Um, But yeah, it just kind of like is a set of bumper lanes, right? Like keeping the prospect kind of going forward. Very cool. Okay. Well, Well, you guys. Even if you you look at a lot of websites, a lot of websites can be very dispersing and send the prospect Mm -hmm. off and think about your website is how do you make that guide the prospect versus just give them information that forces them to go somewhere else. So Mm -hmm. the guardrails, like you said, is a really good good analogy. Yeah. 
Cool. Well, we're going to, you know, put links up for people to find your book and, um, and find out more about that. But when people tune in to this show, they are looking to hear from people who are excellent at what they do, who have had success, but also some failings along the way. And they want to hear those stories about your business, about what's behind the scenes there that's helped get you to where you're at today and where are you trying to go um, tomorrow. And the question I'd love to kick off with um, is a big one, but it really helps set the stage for for this conversation. So if you and I were to speak three years from now and you pick up the phone, oh, Brittany, it's so great to hear from you. I am so excited to tell you about what that you've accomplished in the last three years. So let's fast forward, pretend this is 2025. Okay. Um, and, and it's about my business, not about, you know, my green drink or my golf game. So yeah, you know, a little bit of both, just so you okay. can sprinkle those in. Um, but yes, mostly we want to hear about what, you know, yeah. what thing are you working on now to create three years from now? So I really am passionate about just what we just talked about is how do we really change the mindset and the way that B2B sales and marketing is done? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that we, we have in the last 10 to 15 years have gone through a mindset of what's a, if you're you know, like the SDR and you have the SDR and the, or the sales development rep or the business development rep, and and especially in the tech industry, right? Mm -hmm. We've kind of gone through a very specific process. I really would love to be the one helping to lead that shift to the new way of doing things. And I think as a result of doing that right now, you tend to have a lot of a, a bit of a rift or a chasm between the prospect and the sales and the marketing organization. It's a bit of a cat and mouse game. Yes. Right. I would love to see that rift in that cat and mouse game go away and to see that, hey, we're just working together to accomplish something. You know, I mean, a lot of companies, right? Most companies have a really good product and a really valuable thing to, or whatever they're selling, right? That is being offered to their customers. But in a lot of cases, they don't even get a chance to spotlight it because of the, what I just talked about. You know, the, the sales process and the marketing process gets in their way and gets in the way of the customer. And we want to see the economy pick up. We want to see everything grow. Well, one way to do that is to help people buy more and be more successful selling what you have through just changing that shift. So if we were talking in three years, I would love to be able to say that shift has actually occurred. (laughs) Okay. How are you guys measuring that shift? I'm just curious. Of course you're not mentioning it. So what would, you know, how, what would you objectively say that shift has been made? The structure of well, the, the process? Yeah, I think you would see, you know, again, instead of the back to the emails, right, where it's, or the in mail, the LinkedIn that says, hey, can we jump on a 15 minute phone call? Is, and it's okay to do outreach. I'm not against outreach, don't get me wrong, but there's even ways of doing that differently where rather than saying, hey, can you jump on a 15 minute phone call? Hey, I understand that you might have this problem. Let me start you with some very good information that will start to lead you down step one, step two, step three. So you're starting to see, I mean, these are just simple little examples, but um, I I wanna see, and and again, if I look at the, you know, with Lead Smart, we work with a lot of sales and marketing organizations. I wanna see the conversion rate, you know, leads conversion rates are not good, right? In the traditional way. I mean, maybe a lot of the clients we work with, if they're converting two to 3% of their leads, that's really, really good. Mm -hmm. I think that the lead conversion rate can go way up by changing what I just talked about. So measuring that by seeing how many more people enter into my um, quote unquote pipeline, but it's really, how do I enable them to actually become a customer at a much higher rate than what we're doing right now? So. Right. Right. Very cool. Um, So what are the skills or strategy you're using right now that maybe you've acquired along the way? What are the key things that you pull on in your work today? Oh boy. I think, I mean, for me personally, I pull on a, because I have a weird breadth of knowledge or, you know, of experience, you know, from engineering to sales and marketing, I even did finance for a bit. So I actually even know my way around, you know, a a, a P and L and a balance sheet and Mm -hmm. things like that. So I, I have kind of a a weird and and broad breadth of experience in a lot of different areas. Mm -hmm. And I try and draw on that a lot. And I do, I do recommend, you know, for somebody who's even getting started in business and is get involved in a lot of parts of the business. You know, make sure you understand, you don't have to be super expert, but be fluent in all parts of the business because it will really help you as you're trying to build a business or grow a business 
or even hire and recruit and find out, are you bringing on the right team members? So um, it's, a, it's a worthwhile exercise, even though some of those areas you may not really care for. Right, right. What a great point that actually it's the fact that you've had that unique kind of experience and, and background that you have jumped into these different areas of what it takes to run a business that is probably helping you be really successful in that way. Right. Yeah. And I think, you out. know, and I, and I hire it right team is a big deal. You know, that's having and building a team and knowing the right team and, and what are the right um, skills that you need to be, are you hiring the right people with the right skills and the right abilities? If you don't understand accounting, for example, or finance, how can you realistically recruit and hire somebody to run your finance the way, the way that you really wanted to be run in that business? You have to be able to understand that. Or if you're going to hire an engineer or you're going to hire a sales leader or marketing leader, again, you don't have to be expert, but you need to be fluent, at least in what it is that that job is, so you can mm -hmm. help build the right team. And plus really the great. team respects that too, right? The team respects it if you understand what you're asking them to do. Completely, completely. What kind of breakthroughs have you had along the way, any part of your journey that have changed the way that you lead or see your business? So what kind of like a cute moment happened that gave you an insight or you were like, oh my gosh, like I've been doing it over this way over here, but I need to totally shift. Tell us a story about that. Yeah. So it kind of comes back to what we were just talking about. And I think having, I think if there was one downside of the first company I was with that I spent 10 years with, even though we were pretty large when we sold the company, it was still a very startup ish, you know, um, you, 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 you had the mentality, you try and do as many things as you can yourself mm -hmm. and you do, you know, you take out the trash and clean the bathroom <laughs> Even though we had quite a, a lot of people, we still had a very startup-ish mentality. Mm -hmm. And one thing I learned when I went to Intuit, obviously going into a much bigger organization, is the power of team and how much you can really accomplish, not so much with a big team. And I think that's what was my big takeaway, is size was not the important thing, but it was the quality of the team and the dedication and the focus of that team towards a common goal or a common objective. And the team that I was working with at Intuit was amazing at that. Um, and I really learned a lot from that as like, wow, there's, it's like, you don't even know what you can accomplish with a, a very, a very, it doesn't again not big team, but a really good team mm -hmm. that's aligned towards that common goal and common purpose. So I always try and keep, you know, there's two parts, right? Team, but there's also having that goal and purpose that everybody understands that they're going after. Otherwise, again, it can get diluted pretty quickly. Right, right. What a great point um, in regards to leadership, that presenting that common goal or purpose or whatever for people to align with and to engage with is so central to to being successful with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, one big reason that I started this show is that, or this podcast is is that for over a decade now, I've been sitting with leaders and entrepreneurs and CEOs and hearing um, these the ways in which they feel like they're failing or things are holding them back or they don't really, or the lack of clarity and where to go next. And I see so many people that were struggling kind of in isolation when really there were such a, such common themes in, in, um, the way that they were experiencing these challenges. And I said, oh, this doesn't need to happen behind closed do doors anymore. I want to um, blow this up and like, and create a place for people to hear, hey, you are not alone when you're having these challenges right now. But I feel like there's so many places you can go and hear about the glory stories of being an entrepreneur, the, you know, the, I feel like it's, it's such like a sexy thing to start a business and call yourself an entrepreneur. But there are these real challenges that happen. And I couldn't find a place to direct people um, that were, that were feeling this way. And so as a part of the show, we talk about what would you identify as your, your biggest weakness as a leader or you the greatest challenge that you're experiencing right now. And I ask people to share that, um, in order to create this more comprehensive view of what it means to really be in a, a business owner or a leader. 
Um, so what does that look like for you? What would you consider as your weakness uh, that you're working on right now or the biggest challenge that your business is experiencing? Yeah. Well, so my biggest week, well, I have two weaknesses, so I'll, I'll share. You'll get a two for one special. Um, <laughs> my, my, and this has been something I've done all career, my career, and I constantly am working on is I underestimate the effort, right? I look at something and I go, okay, we can get that done. And, you know, and, you know, just, I mean, you probably, I do it at a day level. I do it at a week level right. or even a month level, you know, and, and you think, oh my gosh, I have a month. How much, look what I could get done in this next month, you know? And, and then what I do is I, um, I tend to pedal too fast, right? I all end up like, okay, I can work weekends and I can do this because I'm going to get it done when I really improperly from the beginning estimated the effort of what it's going to take. And so taking the time in the beginning to under, to estimate if you're going to create a business or you're trying to grow a business, okay, what is that really going to take? And don't sugarcoat it. Cause you're right. You hear so much out there like, oh, you just do this and you know, oh, you run a Facebook ad or something and something yeah. just magically happens and you're, right. you're getting, and you don't under realize that anything, anything you're doing right requires you to go through a process and a journey to get there. And it's usually going to require more effort than you think. And you're going to probably have some headwinds or other things that you aren't necessarily aware of along the way. So that's been a, something I'm constantly looking at as, as a leader, because it, it can be really demoralizing when you do that with your team, right? right? If you over, if you say, okay, we're and then they, oh, wait a minute. I thought, you know, we got, and it's just, so you have to keep that balance for yourself and for your team that, but at the same time, be aggressive, right? It's not that you don't want to be aggressive. It's just properly estimating. So that's right. sort of the, right. the first thing. Um, the second weakness kind of going back to the, what we were talking about is I tend to try and take on too much myself and again, not delegate enough to the team, right? You mentioned Neela who works for me. It's like, she's been awesome because I've been able to delegate so much to her and she's able to do so much as I delegate and it frees up and it, and it gives you a lot more freedom as a, as a business person to, to do some of the things you need to do. But if you're not able or willing to delegate it, it becomes almost like a trap. And then you combine that with underestimating the effort and those two things together can really kill you. Um, and that's where you get a lot of burnout, right? You hear a lot of burnout in business and all of that kind of stuff and startups. It's those two things, in my opinion, it's underestimating the effort and really not delegating and trying to do too much yourself and be the superhero. And I certainly am guilty of both of those in my, in my career. <laughs> well, thanks for being so willing to share that with us. Um, the good news is you're not alone. As um, So I'm a psychologist by training. And what we know is that actually we're inherently bad at trying to figure out how much time something will take. So our, you know, our forecasts, our projections on, on what it will take to get something done, we just don't even seem to get better at either over time. Um, and, and so we really need to allow our team a seat at the table or a voice, at least on the zoom call to give us that feedback about how things are going. What do they think? You know, what, what is, um, an intensity that will like drive performance, but not burn people out or not make them feel like they're always failing right at, at what you expect. That's a really tough balance. Yeah. And we've. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, entrepreneurial operating system or EOS. Yeah, it's a, yes. um, we've that. adopted, yeah, we've adopted that. And I found that has really helped me for some of the things about estimating properly and, and, you know, the issues that we're dealing with. And mm -hmm. so I think whether you use EOS or some other framework, I think frameworks really help that and, and put it front and center. So you're not just, you know, it's something that you're confronting and dealing with every day versus, you know, just trying to react to. Completely. That's a really great point. No matter what it is, having some type of framework right. you can come back to and also like plan with, right? Yeah. Like okay, I see these are my 90 day rocks, you know, like, yeah. and after I complete those, here's what's next. Right. So whatever language it is, whatever tool you use, just having something to help provide that structure as a place for you to always come back and either recalibrate or, or um, figure out where you need to go next. Good, good point. Um, so 
we've talked about what has been successful, like what what behaviors and skills and strategies you've collected along the way that have helped you um, with your business to date. But we also know that we have things about us um, that can also be um, present as challenges. So we talked about you you're not the best at um, at estimating time. But what is there a way that you maybe even think you show up as a bottleneck in your business? You, know, you said you sometimes take on too much, but is there is there anything that um, you're doing that helped you get to where you're at today, but might hold you back from the next step of your business? Yeah, I think it's what we said earlier. Is and I think that the if you're if you're fluent in a lot of things, right, you'll tend to want to put your fingers into a lot of things, mm-hmm. Great. and. Um, and, and what I've learned is like, especially if going back to the, these are all sort of interrelated, going back to if something's not getting done as fast as I would like it, mm-hmm. I'll interject myself. Now that can be very demoralizing for a team member and, and actually really make them way less effective. Mm-hmm. And you feel like you're helping, right? You feel like you're going to yes. jump in and you're going to help them and whatever, but what you're really doing is bypassing them. And when you bypass them, that just makes them less, you know, in their world, right. That that's not a good thing for, for what, what they're doing there. So no, it makes it's, people feel like they're not performing in a right, way that right. they, board, they disengage. Right. They feel like, why am I here? If you're just going to do right. this anyway. <laughs> right. Right. It's like, well, why, why, what is my value? If you're going to come in and do it anyway, or, mm-hmm. you know, or you're going to go, you know, jump in when it's, you know, let me go through the challenges on, right. on all of those things. So it's, it's like, I've had to learn and I'm not a hundred percent perfect, you know, um, and my wife reminds me of this from time to time <laughs> is I, ha- I have to learn to say, okay, how can I help them and coach them, but not go and try and bypass them and say, Hey, here, let me, let me show you how to do that. And, you know, go from there and, and empower them to do more rather than go around them mm-hmm. on the other side. And I think, you know, f- I think that happens all the time with businesses and founders and why businesses stay small in a lot of cases, because the founder, just feels like they have to get involved in all of that and they don't let the team evolve from that. So completely. And if you have hired the right people and they're in the right seats, they should be able to probably do it even better than you could. Right. That's That's the goal. And instead of, you know, cutting them off at the knees, what if instead we ask them, you know, well, how could I support you? Like where, where do you need more resources or, um, you know, collaborations or what do we need to do to help make you the most successful you can be? And so many times leaders aren't asking those questions. They're making assumptions. Maybe they know what's best or whatever, but somebody who spends every single day in that role, if you are not getting feedback from them, if you're not, you know, making them part of the decisions, especially that involve their department or whatever, you're missing a huge amount of information that could be really helpful. Totally agree. And you're, there's a lot of, if you get, if you're hiring the right people, they're bringing a lot that you don't even, you don't know what you don't know, right? You don't know what skills and experience they're bringing to the table. So you want to pull that out of them rather than, you know, assume something um, and go from there. And, and I, and going back to EOS, right? You know, the accountability chart, I have found that to be useful by saying, okay, what are you accountable for? And then let's work together to achieve whatever that accountability is that you're accountable for rather than, and I think that inherently sort of brings out what we just talked about. Really great point. Um, so thank you so much for sharing so many nuggets with us, being totally transparent, helping us, you know, um, see where we can grow to. Um, how can people find you? How can they get in touch with you? How can they hear about or get the book? It's the best way. Well, so the book is um, on Amazon and the audio book just came out as well. So we have a, cool. a written book and an audio book. Um, did you, can you also, record it? Like, did you read it? For the no, I didn't read it. I didn't read it. <laughs> Neela talked me out of that. I heard that process is pretty painful for people. <laughs> um, and we, and we, but we got a really, really good um, narrator. So I'm really, yeah. really pleased with the narrator. But, um, and then you can also go to the revenuezone.com. Um, there's a link to the Amazon there, but there's a the, the, the unique part about the book. There's a bunch of resources, like we have tools and things like that, that you use throughout the book to accomplish a lot of this. And that's all on that revenue zone dot com uh, website. So quite a bit of resources and tools there. Personally, if you want to connect, um, love to connect on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn is tburton5350. 
or yeah. I think there's a few Tom Burton's, but if you find more than one, um, uh, T Burton 5350 is the, is the handle there. And then I do if they're not, you know, seeing it, uh, you guys can find it through me because we're doing the LinkedIn live right now. That's true. And I'll make sure this is on there as well. So it'll be there that way. And then my software company, Lead Smart Technologies, which is leadsmarttech.com. And it dovetails really with the software that we're building for that company, dovetail into this whole, whole mindset that we're, that we're talking about and really trying to change the, even the way people use CRM and how they go about managing the sales process and enabling them more rather than tracking them more, which has historically been mm. how CRM has been used. So all of this kind of all fits right. together. I love it. Wonderful. Well, Tom, I'm so grateful that you decided to come on and share yeah, your eye opening right. insights with us. Super helpful. Um, and thank you to you guys, the audience members, because without you, uh, I would just be talking to an empty space and that would be kind of boring for everybody. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sharing how these insights have helped you guys along the way. I always love your feedback. So please share your stories with us, how this has been helpful. And we definitely share them in future episodes. So thanks again for joining us. Until next time. Thanks for joining us this week on Eye Openers. Make sure to visit brittanydroz.com slash podcast for this week's show notes. And if you found value in today's episode, I would so appreciate you giving us a rating on Apple Podcasts or share it with a friend. Also, don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. This all helps to support the show.